We had gotten at the end of last time to the big rip. This is where the ever expanding cosmological constant, which is of course a contradiction in terms. Uh, if you imagine that dark energy is not a cosmological constant, that it's actually increasing in time, rips everything to shreds, the universe becomes infinite in size in a finite amount of time and everything gets pulled apart. What I want to start by doing today is to go back and do that again slowly, okay? Uh, because I think uh, this, is, this is not a, uh, uh, it's not a simple line of reasoning that, that leads you to this. So let's go all the way back to what we know about uh, uh, the universe from, ob from observing galaxies, supernovas, things like that. Uh, we know that the universe is expanding uh, and that we know Hubble already figured that out. We know this from the Hubble law. From the Hubble law and from uh, other, uh, uh, just in general, from the study of standard candles at relatively low redshift. So uh, distances out to, I don't know, z of less than 0.2 or so. You can't tell the difference between an accelerating or a decelerating universe, all you know is that it's expanding and you can figure out how fast it's expanding. Uh, now, the next question then becomes uh, the rate of expansion. Is the rate of expansion changing? Is it, go is it accelerating? Is it decelerating? What's going on there? Uh, and so you want to compare acceleration versus deceleration which is a fancy word, as you know, for slowing down. Uh, and deceleration, this is uh, relatively easy to grasp. Uh, this is what, uh, uh, what happens because of matter. Uh, matter exists. It's got gravitational force. Uh, and gravitational force tends to hold things together. So if you've got something that's moving apart with gra uh, and there's some gravitational force, it'll tend to hold it together and thus slow it down. Most of the matter, it turns out, is this weird dark matter, which we don't understand. Uh, but uh, uh, that's what's responsible for the deceleration. If you're going to make it go faster, you need something much weirder that pushes outward, that has repulsive force. Uh, this, we believe, actually exists. This we label dark energy. And so the question of is it accelerating or is it decelerating is basically a question of uh, is how much dark energy is there versus how much matter is there. Because the more, if you have more of this than this, then it will accelerate uh, and vice versa. And what we have discovered by uh, supernovae observations with redshifts of greater than 0.3 and uh, by now out to about uh, about a redshift of one or so, uh, demonstrate that, uh, well, what exactly does this say? Let's go slowly. Uh, in the past, uh, the universe was expanding more slowly than it is now. And therefore, those three dots are the mathematical symbol for therefore. Um, therefore, the universe is accelerating. And therefore, there's more dark energy than there is matter. And you'll recall we did the little pie chart of the universe, and it turns out it's three quarters dark energy and one quarter matter. Uh, and uh, those proportions are determined by uh, the uh, rate at which the universe is accelerating. Not the rate at which it's expanding, but the rate at which it's accelerating. Because that's the change in the expansion. Fine, so far. Uh, or maybe it isn't fine. I should, I should pose that as a question. Fine. Uh, this is the basic uh, uh, premise of where we had gotten to about a week ago. Yes, sir? Huh? How dark energy causes acceleration? Excellent question. I have no idea. Uh, because we don't have any idea what it is. Uh, and uh, it shows up, the reason we have even a name for it, you know, is that it, it, is that it showed up in Einstein's equations as a p 
potential contribution to the universe uh, that, you, that you could add but didn't have to. Uh, uh, constant of integration for those of you who like that kind of thing. What it is physically, very hard to understand. The only physical explanation that's been offered, uh, well, many have been offered, but the only one that uh, 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 connects to anything else we know is the idea that it's the vacuum energy predicted by quantum mechanics. And it turns out that if that's true, it ought to be 10 to the 120 times stronger. Uh, and so that's not a good prediction. Uh, and so exactly how this works, what the mechanism is, what the nature of this stuff is, completely unknown. And uh, the only reason we think it's there is that we see its effect. We see the universe getting faster. And so it's just a name that's attached to whatever is causing that effect. OK, yes? It was expanding more slowly than it is now. Right. So that is uh, this uh, transformation between these two different kinds of graphs, one of which is the observed graph and one of which uh, is the uh, uh, is the plot of uh, the scale factor versus time. Here's now. Here's 1. We're at 1 and now. And so if it were not uh, accelerating, if it were just going or, uh, coasting along, that would be a straight line. And uh, what happens is we can look back into the past, and what we see is this. So at this point, if you think about it, suppose. Uh, Believe me for a sec that this is true. Supposing you were sitting here, what the, the rate of expansion is the slope of this line. Uh, that's how much you're expanding. Uh, and so at this point, the slope is shallower than it is up here. And so uh, one interpretation of this line is that in the past, it used to be expanding you know, like this. And now it's expanding like this. Ah, how do, you, how do you know it's doing that particular shape? Uh, well, uh, you, of course, observe points all along the way here. Uh, now, uh, we're about to get to the question of whether that shape actually continues. Uh, if you ask, how do you know that it would continue this way? Uh, that, of course, you don't know for sure. If you invent some piece of magic whereby uh, everything changes right now, uh, for some obscure reason, it could go off in some other direction. Uh, but the assumption is that whatever it is that's, that we do not live at a special time, and that therefore whatever it is that's doing the accelerating is going to keep at it. Uh, and indeed, the whole of the big rip, which is where I'm going with this, uh, comes about by asking the question, supposing the acceleration rate is changing in a different way from the way we thought it was going to. Uh, just to complete the thought here, uh, the way this works out in the observational plane, you'll recall, looks like this. Here's the empty universe in this set of units. Uh, and you observe a bunch of supernovae, and they seem to be doing that. And that line, if you then uh, transform uh, redshift and distance, this is kind of a weird measure of distance, into uh, scale factor and time. Uh, let me make this line solid so that it the two graphs correspond. This line and that line correspond with each other. And so as you observe many points along here, that's essentially observing many points along here. Yes? Um, given the empirical data that we know now, um, if we were to, extra to if we were to um, extrapolate that curve, mm -hmm. would it actually intersect with the axis, or would, we, or would we need to have it? Ah, let me come back to that. Okay. Let me come back to that. The answer is yes, it does go to zero. Uh, it, it doesn't keep going up like this. Right. But let me come back to that in a second, and you'll see why. OK. Um, okay. Um, so it's all a balance of dark energy versus dark matter, or matter in general, but the dark matter predominates. And at the moment, it is true uh, that the dark energy is 
uh, there's more of it. It exerts more, uh, uh, more of an influence on the universe. Therefore, the universe is, ex is ex not just ex expanding, but also accelerating. We know that because these points are above the line, not below the line. Uh, but this didn't always have to be true. This balance changes with time. Oh, so currently, uh, DE blows away the DM, uh, but uh, this can change. This changes. In fact, this is almost certain uh, to change with time. And the reason is that the energy density of the dark energy and the matter density of the dark matter behave differently as you change the size of the universe. It's all about the density here. So matter density uh, in the past, uh, you have the same amount of matter but the universe was smaller. Density is equal to mass over volume. So if you have the same m but smaller v, uh, this would have to have been bigger in the past. And in fact, it goes as the scale factor cubed, or one over the scale factor cubed. Uh, just because volume goes as a linear scale cubed. So in the past, there was the, the, the uh, matter density was much greater than it is right now. And therefore, the gravitational force trying to hold the universe together was greater than it is right now. Uh, but the cosmological constant is constant. And what that means is that its density is constant. And what that means is that in the past, the dark energy density was the same as it is now. That's just the way uh, this particular piece of Einstein's equations works. It's a constant. Uh, now, if you're about to ask the question, well, how does anything behave that way, I'm going to give you the same answer. Uh, you know, they have this wonderful thing in the British Parliament where they ask, uh, ask the prime minister question, obnoxious questions. And when they start getting too many obnoxious questions in a row, uh, what he'll do is he'll look at the camera and say, I refer the honorable gentleman to the answer I gave some moments ago. So uh, if you're going to ask what this is and why it behaves that way, I will refer you to the answer I gave to the honorable gentleman one at some moments ago, namely, I don't have a clue, uh, something they don't generally say in political situations. Um, all right, uh, so it's the same as now, but look at the implication of this. If the uh, matter density gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go into the past, and the dark energy density does not, then at some point in the past, it must have been true that the matter density overwhelms the dark energy. And uh, at some point in the past, uh, the dark energy and the dark matter exert comparable effects on the universe. And before that, dark matter wins. That is to say, the universe was decelerating. Now turn this around and go in chronological order. Uh, uh, from the start of the universe until some moment, the universe decelerated. It, got, it, it was expanding, but it, 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 kept, uh, uh, it kept getting slower. Then after some moment, and we know that this moment was in our past, because after this moment, it starts to accelerate. And we know that it's accelerating now. Uh, and so at some point in the past, there was a magic moment where everything balanced, and then it started to accelerate. So now what does this look like on our graphs? 
what does this look like on the graphs here? Well, uh, let's do the A versus T thing again. Here we are. Here's, the, uh, here's our reference empty universe. Uh, and so recently it's been accelerating. So, you know, if we look into the past, and then the prediction is the extrapolation back to zero looks kind of like this. And remember, if it looks like if it looks like this, it's decelerating. If it looks like this, it's accelerating. And so the dotted lines are extrapolations, are extrapolations based on the idea that the dark energy is the cosmological constant and the dark matter behaves like matter ought to behave. And so if you make those two assumptions, this is the curve you get. And so this is what you expect for omega matter equals 0.25, omega lambda equals 0.75 at, the pr at present. And so you can predict, given, uh, given these two quantities and a measurement of H0 equals about 70, this gives you an age of the universe, that is to say, the time from when A equals 0 to now of the universe of something like 13 point, uh, I think it's actually at the moment, 13.4 billion years. Plus or minus, I don't know, 0.4 or something, something like that. Under the, this set, the assumption that lambda equals, uh, that, lambda, that the cosmological constant really is constant, that you've got these kinds of proportions and this kind of current uh, Hubble constant. And then you can just extrapolate all these lines in whatever direction you like uh, and figure out where it crosses A equals zero. Yes? Excellent question. The question is, can we see back far back in the past to see this deceleration? The answer is just about yes, and I'll show you some data in a second. Uh, because this is a very strong prediction of the model. That is to say that it should turn around. If you're imagining that there's something wacky about supernovae uh, and that as you go into the past they look fainter or something, as you were assuming on the problem set, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily predict that that would turn around and do the other thing as you go further back in the past. So this is a very strong prediction of what ought to happen cosmologically. And so, of course, people have been trying to test it. Yes? Um, if the density of the universe is changing, then wouldn't that indicate that we're in special time right now given the fact that the current density of the universe is yeah, so uh, the question is uh, about if the density is changing, why does the, what's so unusual about now that we're close to the critical density? The thing you have to remember is the critical density also changes with time. It's based on, remember the critical density, it's 3h squared over something or other? Well, h changes with time because the velocity is more or less the same, but the distances all change. So it's always well, what is true is that uh, the way it works out mathematically, what's true is that the sum of these two quantities has always been close to <coughs> 1. The ratio changes, uh, but the sum of these two, if the total omega, if the total omega starts as 1, it stays at 1. Uh, but it turns out it's the total omega that, you can that, that is conserved. Uh, and, and we'll come back to that point uh, a little later. OK, uh, let's see. Right, OK, so yes, let's go there. Let's go, let's go for the observational evidence. What would you expect it to be? Here we go. Uh, this one again. We keep going back and forth between these two plots. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, so here's empty universe, as always. Uh, and then uh, in this plot, Acceleration means a positive slope. So if you're moving up in this plot, the universe has been accelerating, is accelerating at that particular redshift, at that particular time in the past. So, you know, the, the data we've looked at so far kind of look like points along a line like this. That's the demonstration that the universe is now accelerating. So here's the prediction. 
And you know, here's a magic moment where uh, at that point this slope is flat, and so on this side it's <laughs> decelerating, and on this side it's accelerating. And the question is, is it getting further away from uh, 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 is it moving up compared to the empty universe, or is it moving down compared to the empty universe? Because the empty universe neither accelerates nor decelerates. That's the definition of an empty universe. It doesn't have any mass. It doesn't have any energy. The, excel the expansion rate is constant forever. So uh, if you're going this way with respect to that line, or going this way with respect to that line, uh, you're accelerating, and if you're coming back, uh, going in the other direction, you're decelerating. So here's, here's a closed universe, right, which is going to, uh, uh, this, is, this is a big crunch universe, which is going to recollapse because it's decelerating all the time. Now, interestingly, this turnaround point, uh, where you turn around between accelerating and decelerating, is not so far back into the past. It's, uh, uh, if, if you believe this set of parameters, the standard model, it's at around 0.8. We can see stuff at 0.8. And uh, you could hope to go and see things uh, even further out. Uh, turns out it's kind of, now, uh, right at, o, if you only go out to about 0.8, which is about as far out as, the, as they did for the first time round, you're not going to see the turnaround because you know, it's just more or less flat. You've got a few points out there, and you're going to have a tough time telling the difference between that and that at this point here. But if you go out just a little bit further, you might really <coughs> be able to see this turnaround happening. Unfortunately, that turns out to be hard observational. Uh, it's hard to see supernovae with redshifts greater than 1 uh, for a number of different reasons. First of all, they're faint. The further away they are, the fainter they are. Second of all, they appear on top of galaxies. Obviously, they live in galaxies. Uh, the further away you look, the galaxies look smaller. And so the supernova appear to be super. The further away you look, uh, the more of the gal more more light from the galaxy the supernova is superimposed on, and it becomes harder to separate the light from the supernova and the light from uh, the galaxy that it lives in. And the third part is that the light is redshifted. Very redshifted, redshifted by a factor of two. So supernovae give off most of their light in optical light, which we can observe. Uh, but by the time they're at a redshift of one, all the wavelengths are doubled. And so most of the radiation is in the infrared, which is much harder to see from the ground because everything glows in the infrared. Uh, and you've, it's like, look, as I said before, it's like looking in the daytime. The whole sky is glowing. Your telescope is glowing. Uh, it's just really hard to make those kinds of observations. It is possible, however, to do. It's much easier to do this from space. Now, faint is faint. It doesn't matter whether you're in orbit or not. But the other two things are greatly aided by looking from space. Uh, point two. Uh, you get much better uh, images from space. Uh, and you may recall, last time I showed you a picture of a supernova, and from the ground, uh, you know, it was a little extra light on top of some galaxy. And then when you look from space, the galaxy was clearly de delineated, and then the supernova was a tiny point in the outskirts of that galaxy. So it makes it much, much easier to separate uh, uh, the galaxy from the supernova. And it is also true that the infrared background light is much fainter, because you can keep stuff cold out there. Uh, the infrared background light is much fainter, uh, and there's no atmospheric absorption. The atmosphere actually absorbs a large fraction of the infrared light that, uh, uh, that hits us. Um, 
That's actually why the greenhouse effect works. Because light comes in as optical light, and it makes it all the way through. Then it heats up the surface of the Earth. The Earth radiates heat, which doesn't make it through the atmosphere. It gets trapped. Um, so uh, there's no atmospheric absorption out there. And so uh, you have a much easier time doing this from space. So what they have been doing is recently uh, people, in particular a guy named Adam Rees, uh, have been using the space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, to find high redshift supernovae. This, uh, there is a flaw in the way the space telescope is designed from the point of view of trying to do this experiment. And the flaw is that it doesn't look at very much of the <coughs> sky at once. It only looks at a small field of view. of few, so you don't find many. Because you're just not looking at that big a part of the sky. Uh, and so uh, you can only, f you only look at a tiny piece of the sky at once. However, they have spent, because this is of some uh, clear importance, they've spent many, many, many hundreds of observing hours uh, with the Space Telescope trying to track down a few supernovae at a redshift greater than one. Uh, and they have now succeeded in doing so. So here's the, what the data look like. This is from Adam's recent paper, 2004. I guess it's no longer quite so recent. Uh, and this is the plot. Let me see if I can focus this. Uh, it's actually the Xerox quality. Uh, we have a joke in astronomy that uh, many uh, important objects turn out to be uh, LSXTSs, which stands for Low Significant Xerox Transient Source. Uh, that means you've made a Xerox and a little blip appears on your graph, and somebody says, what's that point in the upper right-hand corner? And you say, oh, that's the Xerox machine. All right, so I apologize for that, but look what's happening. This is redshift. This is the, this is the plot we've been looking at before. 0, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, and 2. And this is the delta M minus M axis, so zero is what you expect uh, uh, the empty universe to have. And he has marked on here a different set of lines from the set of lines I've been drawing, but nevertheless, you can see what's going on. Here are, these are all supernovae, uh, uh, all the supernovae they know. Uh, these kinds of fuzzy gray points are the ones they found with the space telescope. The ones in here are uh, the ground-based ones known at the time. And what they've done is they've, uh, is they've averaged them together in, in groups of redshift, grouping by redshift. That's the bottom thing. So each one of these points is an average of many supernovae. Uh, this point is an average of these two. Uh, and then as you get down to lower redshifts, where they have lots and lots of them, the precision gets much better. But you can definitely see what's happening. Here out to about you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, it's going up. And then it does definitely seem like it's going down. Uh, and so there really is now some evidence for this, for this turnaround. Now, uh, it kind of all depends on these two points. Uh, I have a rule of thumb. My rule of thumb is you can put your thumb over any one point uh, because you never know uh, what screw up might have happened in any one measurement. Uh, so uh, I can't really do that on the top. But if I do this, okay, and I make that point go away, uh, you could still kind of draw a line that keeps going up. Uh, it would miss this point by a little, but not by a lot. Uh, it's really this that does it. It's these last two individual supernovae down there which really make the case that the thing is turning over and coming back down. Now, uh, you have to worry a little bit. And, and there's actually a good reason to worry about uh, uh, the brightnesses of high redshift supernovae. Uh, and let me give you one particular reason to worry. Uh, a reason to worry. Uh, namely, gravitational lensing. Remember gravitational lensing? Uh, you stick some mass in, in, in the middle between you and the object you're looking at. It focuses the light. Gravitational lensing makes things look brighter.
The further away you look at something, the more likely it is that there's something in between that will do the lensing. Uh, so first of all, point one, more distant objects more likely to be lensed. Point two, uh, if you're out looking for very distant, very faint objects, which are the ones you're going to see first? The bright ones, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, at the sort of faint limit, uh, you see abnormally bright things first. I can't even spell that. Abnormally bright things preferentially. So you could imagine if you're basing your entire cosmology on one or two high redshift supernovae, you got to ask yourself the question, supposing those happen to be lens. So let me now go back to this plot. Here's the plot. So if they're lensed, then they're brighter, then they seem to be brighter than they actually are. They're actually fainter than they look. That would have the effect that this one actually ought to be up here and this one actually ought to be up here if they were lensed by some amount. So if these things are lenses, then the true correct position of these points would be higher up in the graph than it actually is. So this is the effect of lensing. Now, when it was only one of these points, uh, people were very concerned about this. Now that there's two, people are a lot less concerned because, you know, it would be pretty bad luck to have both of the supernovae uh, that you know about at high redshift turn out to be lens. If they had 20, uh, this whole problem would go away because there'd be no possible way that you could be so unlucky. At, well, uh, you could calculate the probability that you would be so unlucky as to have the first 20 high redshift supernovae, you know, happen to line up right behind some massive object, and it would be some incredibly small probability. So each time you observe another one of these things out here and it's low, you get around this lensing problem. I should say this is only one of a number of problems. These things are very hard to observe. They're very faint objects. Uh, but nevertheless, I think at the moment, uh, the, uh, uh, the evidence for this turnaround is highly suggestive, uh, but not yet wholly conclusive. Uh, all right, but now, uh, suppose uh, you, you actually want to get higher accuracy than just seeing the thing turn around. Because suppose dark energy isn't constant. Suppose uh, the big rip really is going to happen. Then DE density increases with time. This leads to the big rip, as we discussed last time. And therefore, the dark energy density was less in the past than in now. And therefore, uh, the deceleration, uh, the moment of balance between deceleration, uh, between deceleration and acceleration uh, was more recent. Because as you go back in the past, under this new scenario where, there's, where the uh, density of dark energy is, is increasing with time, it's therefore decreasing as you go into the past. So as you go into the past, two things happen. The uh, density of matter gets bigger, and the density of dark energy gets less. So there's an additional effect that will make that crossover happen earlier. Uh, and so uh, to summarize on these uh, uh, by now, uh, uh, almost boring and ubiquitous plots here, All right? Uh, so here's here's the kind of standard cosmological model, uh, and if it's going to be a big oh, and then this predicts in the future that it's going to go something like that. If it's a big rip, then what happens is it's doing this, 
and it's going to do that uh, because the dark the dark matter uh, takes over from the dark energy more uh, uh, more recently in the past because you've also lost oomph in your dark energy, but the dark energy is getting bigger and bigger with time. This then translates onto this plot. Uh, and here is what we expect, and here's the kind of prediction into the future, uh, uh, future, future of observations uh, further into the past in time. And what you would expect is that this would sort of keel over earlier. So this is a big rip cosmology. Big rip cosmology has uh, the same Big Rip would have the same expansion rate now, the same acceleration now, uh, but more acceleration in the future than you expect, and more deceleration in the past. And so it's important not just to see this turnaround, uh, but to actually plot in detail where that line goes. Because if it turns out that your, that your supernovae are kind of lined up like this, or they're kind of lined up like this, you already know that there are a bunch of them like this, or that they're kind of lined up like this, makes a huge difference in how you understand the dark energy and tells you something knew about the dark energy. In fact, it tells you the first thing you know about the dark energy other than that it exists, namely that it would be getting bigger or less big or maybe staying constant as a function of time. Yes? Well, if, um, if the deceleration was, if it was earlier than expected, you know, mm. following the big, big rip cosmology, yeah. wouldn't we have seen it already since we can already see the Ah, so uh, these three lines at about, you know, 0.8 are very, very close together. Uh, they don't diverge all that much until a redshift until the turnaround at about a redshift of 0.8 to 1. Now, in principle, you could go out and make a whole bunch of you know measure 10,000 of these things at a redshift of 0.5 and try and distinguish that way. Okay, so how are we going to figure this out? The space telescope kind of finds these things one at a time. It's going to be awfully tough to make this distinction. Uh, but let me introduce you to two projects currently underway, the goal of which is uh, to figure this out. And they, they, they do the exact two things that we've just been talking about. One is designed to go deep to high redshift, uh, and the other is designed to do many, many, many at intermediate redshift. Uh, so uh, there is something called the, uh, so there's a space mission, a space telescope, uh, this is called JDAM, stands for Joint, uh, Joint Dark Energy Mission. And the joint means joint between NASA and the Department of Energy. Whoever named this stuff Dark Energy gets a little prize because now we get money from the Department of Energy to study it. Uh, Let's see, and, and the idea uh, of which an example is something called SNAP, one proposal, that's the supernova, cosmolo uh, supernova acceleration probe. This is, this is an example of one mission proposed to be JDAM. Uh, this is uh, an example. Uh, and uh, it's an example I'm familiar with because we have people here at Yale who are working on it. Uh, and there are competitors. They haven't actually selected the thing yet. Uh, and what it is going to be is it's a space telescope that differs from the current space telescope in two major ways. One is it has a wide field of view. Uh, dozens of times bigger than the current space telescope. So it can do 20, uh, let me see if I can remember. It's, it's uh, like 20, it's, it's over 100 times bigger field of view than the current space telescope. So the discovery rate of supernovae will be much, much greater. And it's optimized for the infrared. 
And so its goal is to find many supernovae with redshift greater than one, perhaps out to a redshift of two. That's its purpose in life. Uh, and uh, uh, proposals are currently being evaluated for this. Launch time is supposed to be, well, the optimists say 2013, but that means congressional funding this year, which is actually unlikely. Uh, more likely 2016 or 2017, and then we'll know. Yes? Oh, uh, it's very nice to look at the infrared because anything at high redshift shines in the infrared. And so if you're looking at high redshift galaxies, how galaxies evolve, and so forth, uh, this is useful too. There's actually a big debate over whether you totally set the thing up to do nothing but supernovae or whether you sort of generalize it and spend half your time doing other things. Uh, and there's one other project, at least, which I'll describe next week, that, that, that these guys are interested in doing. Uh, but there's a real trade-off between making it a general purpose telescope like the Hubble or doing this one thing especially well. And that's you know, the kind of thing that's currently under discussion. So SNAP is one example of uh, where people might go in the future. Another is a, a, a ground-based project called the Large uh, Synoptic Survey Telescope. This is otherwise known as LSST. LSST, the plan is, this is and this has a lot of other science beside this, it's going to do a full skirt survey of the sky, survey of the sky uh, every three days. So it's going to, every three nights, it marches across the entire sky, takes a really deep image of the sky. And so the consequence of this for cosmology is that you find every low and intermediate uh, redshift supernova. That's tens to hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, maybe 10,000 a year. approximately. So you find lots of these things. So first of all, you build up incredible statistics out to a redshift of about a half. So huge statistics to z of about a half. That's kind of where its limit is going to kick in. Uh, and you also uh, can study the details of subclasses of supernovae. So this is important because you know, if you're fooling yourself because the distant supernovae are different somehow from the local supernovae, they're fainter for some reason, uh, but in the local sample, only one in 100 is of the faint kind. If you've got 10,000, that means you've got you know, a sample of 100 of the weird subclass that's causing you trouble. So this will be hugely helpful not only in beating down the statistics so that you can tell the difference between lines that are really quite close to each other, you know, uh, theoretical predictions that are close to each other, but it also will test the systematic problems that you might have different kinds of supernovae and generally enhance your overall confidence that you know what you're talking about. Also, uh, these kinds of sky surveys uh, are of benefit for many, many other uh, fields of astronomy. <laughs> the uh, issue with this is the following statistic. Uh, 30 terabytes of data per night. Right? That's uh, 30,000 gig per night. Uh, 30 million megabytes every night. Uh, and so this is not something that us normal astronomers can handle. Uh, and so the recent news from the LSST project is Google has joined the project. Uh, and so we're bringing in the, we're bringing in the, yeah, right. Uh, we're bringing in the big boys for this. Uh, and I think this is kind of Google universe, right? Uh, because it's a, it's, it, you know, you take all, you do this for a few years and you've done a hundred sky surveys. You can then add them all up and get incredibly deep data. And so I guess Google figured, you know, if somebody's going to be uh, 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 piling up a catalog of the entire known universe, they'd better be a part of it. Uh, and it's fortunate for us because they're probably the only people in the world who can create a data. 
database uh, of data coming in at this rate. Uh, and I should say, keep in mind that you have to actually not just acquire this data, you have to actually look at it each night. Because you've got to actually discover these supernovae in real time. Because they're going to be gone three weeks from now or, or, or three months from now. And so you not only have to pile up 30 terabytes of data every night, you've got to actually look at it and find all the interesting objects. So. Uh, uh, the plan currently is to operate for uh, at least five and probably ten years. They have a site picked out. They're going to put it down in Chile, actually on the mountain where uh, uh, our tiny telescope is. Uh, and so we're, we actually like this because they'll pay for some of the infrastructure costs down there. Uh, you know, hopefully for all of the infrastructure costs. But uh, uh, negotiations still in progress. And uh, uh, they, they have a whole design plant for this. It's all ready to go, uh, but it's going to cost a fair amount of money to build. And what's even more important, it's going to cost an enormous amount of money to run uh, just on a night-to-night -night basis. So actually, the construction costs of the telescope are not the dominant cost. The dominant costs are building the software and running the program. And it turns out that's harder to get some rich guy to give you $100 million for. Uh, and uh, it's ground-based, so it doesn't fall into the NASA category. And so it isn't clear where the money is going to come from. They actually have a fair amount of private money already piled up. Uh, they, and as I say, they have detailed, elaborate plans for this thing. You can look at their website. Uh, in fact, you will have to look at their website, because that's going to be part of the problem set. Uh, and uh, so these are two of the projects which are currently uh, uh, being designed and hopefully soon will be built uh, that are going to uh, try and push this a little further and try and find out more about the dark energy than simply the fact that it exists. OK, um, let me put back up this uh, uh, piece of paper with details. Remember, no sections on Monday. No sections on Monday.